In this video, we want to show you how God is working in various pioneer works, where men and women from all ethnic backgrounds and walks of life are being rescued from death, redeemed, and renewed by the gospel of Jesus, and refreshed by the love and fellowship of other believers. In this video, we want to show you how God is working in various pioneer works, where men and women from all ethnic backgrounds and walks of life are being rescued from death, redeemed, and renewed by the gospel of Jesus, and refreshed by the love and fellowship of other believers.
Well, there's a good place to put an amen in there, isn't there? Amen. Aren't you glad you have a heart that feels that way? Wherever he leads you, you'll follow. And then the confidence behind that. We have our God that will go with us all the way. Well, that's good news. This Penns Creek uh, group this morning as our God is going to be with us. Scriptures on my mind, a couple scriptures found in Psalm uh, 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Verse 11 says, Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. We're here at Penns Creek uh, Camp Maiden to practice the Word of God. Not just hear it preached, not just to read it, but by the grace of God to practice it. And aren't you glad God's designed worship that way so we can practice what the Bible says? Ye righteous, it says, if we're one of those that's right with God, that's us this morning, in Penns Creek Tabernacle today, about ready to begin a song service, he says, be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous. Shout for joy, all ye that are in upright in heart. Well, that means it's okay to raise a hand. That's a little less than a shout. So we promote that, don't we, around here? We believe in that. We still believe it's okay for a certain person to praise the Lord out loud, don't we? Oh, thank the Lord for that, for the loud mouths. But oh, if you're righteous, that means even the righteous silent one's got to do something. We've got to worship God, don't we? And aren't you glad we want to? And we will, by His grace. The morning and afternoon services, uh, we run a, a little bit different in this way. If you're new, I'm just giving this as some people already know this, but if you're new to Pants Creek, you wouldn't know this, so we're giving you an update here at the beginning, is that we often will incorporate a, a time of testimony, a, a singer come, come and lead us congregational numbers, and we give you a chance if you want to share how God's working in your life or praise God for doing something in your life. We can't do that in the evenings when we get filled. People can't uh, hear. And you can't get much edification if there's not hearing. You know what I mean? So as we're a little closer together, most sit a little bit closer, gives us an opportunity to hear a little bit. And I, it's tough because, you know, you always fight. Should you take a mic? Should you do this? And, uh, you know, I haven't been used to that growing up. You know what I mean? I like to, like, just respond with the praise of God. So we allow this morning service and afternoon service to do this, and, and I'm not about forcing testimonies, twisting your head. You know what I mean? Because the Bible's already told us what the righteous are supposed to do. Every once in a while to give praise to God in his sanctuary. So we're going to give you an opportunity to that. So we have new ones here, and we don't want you to miss out on that. If you feel you want to praise God, we want to give you them opportunities. And if nobody does, we go to another part of the service, and that's okay with us, because every service is different. And one thing's important, we want God to lead us and direct us. And sometimes he wants to really focus on the word of God and we don't feel like testifying us, not because we're bad people. Sometimes God has something totally different in mind for us and he needs that little extra time for the preachers or the, that message of the message to sink in or the special song is going to minister to us in a, a special way. So, so God knows and we're not trying to dictate to God what he wants to do, but we want to do as a camp meeting crowd and myself, is be open to God and the leadership of his spirit to accomplish whatever he wants to in Penns Creek Camp. And we know that God uses testimonies, and he knows if you share, God's going to use you. Thank you again for being here. Brother Randall, come and lead us. Appreciate you. God bless you. All right, take your chorus books this morning and turn to song number 201. Song number 201, Let Me Touch Him, Let Me Touch Jesus. touch him, let me touch Jesus, let me touch him as he passes by, then when I shall reach out to others, they shall know him, they shall live, 
his name. Do you remember when he touched you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Maybe somebody has a testimony this morning Thank that you'd you. like to share. Right here, the first morning service of camp meeting. Well, Brother Paul. Randall, I was hoping uh, that you would sing a song about holiness uh, this morning because I shared with the uh, ministerial brethren uh, one day this week. Was it yesterday? I can't remember. A couple days ago. Just of my need uh, for entire sanctification. Not even plan on being here in the service. I walked up the mountain road for a, for a youth service, and there's our youth preacher right there. So uh, no one was there. So instead of worshiping with the kids, I've got to try and worship with the big kids. I won't tell you if I'm disappointed. But uh, I just, uh, j just as la these last couple days, it just seems like all I can see is, is carnality. And the Lord is just uh, helping me this morning. I came here, came here to pray. 
and what's becoming, I think, at least for me, the, the great holiness chapter of the Bible, which is uh, Psalm 119. And the, uh, the caliph, or whatever section it is, there it's in sections in the scripture. And it, it begins and ends with these words, and that's just my prayer for this camp meeting. And uh, the psalmist says, My soul fainted for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. And it ends with this. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. I'm trusting in the Lord, and I'm seeking you this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're pulling for you, Brother Paul. Amen. Pulling for you. Praise the Lord. Somebody else. Testimony this morning. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Anybody else? Let's turn back to chorus number 70. Chorus number 70. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. Well, we started praying for certain people last night. Uh, Sister Durkee, Michelle Durkee, broke two legs, needs our prayers. Uh, Brother John Walters had a fall, Brother Kenny Walters' brother, uh, a while back, and now he fell again. It's just in real bad shape. And we pray that the Lord be with him, so let's remember him. Uh, maybe you have another burden on your heart, a concern. You want this camp meeting crowd to share in prayer today. Anyone have that request? All right, Kratz, many of us know him, so let's remember him in prayer. Brother Sankey, Brother thank you. Been weaker and weaker as months have gone by, so let's pray for him. Yes. Amen. Anyone else? Good to see Brother Bigger with us. I'm going to ask him if he would lead us in prayer as we kneel together and bring these requests in this camp meeting before God. Brother Bigger, lead us, please.
Remember our pre-service uh, tonight, the update from two different directions. So Limit Fort Myers and then also youth camp. So do keep that in mind. Be here for that pre-service update. Uh, again, thank you for being Penn Street Camp. We appreciate it so, so very much. This time we're going to have a special number and song. And afterwards, Brother Purdy is share. Uh, appreciate him. Appreciate his life. Uh, student many years ago at Penview. We was one of the teachers back in those days. Uh, and uh, I was going to... I was going to he come into homiletics class. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to be his homiletic teacher. We had Chester Hanfield come in and do that too. It's, it's pretty amazing. You get a, a little bit, you know, it was amazing. The scope of abilities that come into homiletics class. We had one guy I realized I have to start teaching all different. I, I revamped the class when I got him. It wasn't Nathan here. And Brother Purdy, <laughs> but I literally did, because I all of a sudden realized this guy got saved. He had for no Christian home. He never went to Sunday school until he started going after he got saved. Do you know what it is to try to preach when you don't know the Book of Jonah? I had an assignment: read the, uh, you know, read somewhere to preach a five-minute exhortation. And he started studying that Jonah, and he got up to do his preaching. And he had to stop. He said, "I don't know the rest of the story." I thought, "Whoa." That would be pretty hard to preach if you did. I'm glad at 12 years of age I started going to church record. My mom got saved. Oh, am I glad for those years. I didn't realize the benefit of going to Sunday school and going to church in my life. Then when I become a Christian and called to preach, God had some foundations to work in my life. But again, some come to our Bible schools with very little foundation. We thank God for their working in their lives. I thought, what am I going to teach Brother Purdy? He already preaches better than most people was ever going to preach. Chester Hanfield, Hanfield is a very good preacher. I admit, wow, are they going to make me look good as homiletic teacher? You know, I taught Brother Purdy at Chester Hanfield. Oh, I did. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that, wow, isn't that unique? You know what I thank God for? I thank God for Brother Purdy and Brother Hanfield and... Uh, different ones. I said about Brother Jeremy Fuller, I told him he had such an ability. 
I told him that he ought to write a commentary someday, like Wearsby has, in a holiness way. He hadn't done it yet. But I told him as a college student that he had that right in him that he could do it. Because every once in a while you can just see it. God's placed his hands on certain ones. It's a God thing. It's not a man thing. It's no praise to any man. No praise to Brother Purdy or Brother Jeremy or Brother Chester, a handful of others, Brother James Plank, a special ability God's given. Now, they have to develop that with God, but you can't get there without God. But I thank God for these men that let God work in their lives, develop the skills that God give them, and they become excellent ministers of the Word of God, and we need them. And we're praying that God's going to continue to raise them up. And it is our honor to have Brother Purdy with us, a good friend. We've become a good friend, and we just love him and his family very much. And uh, we appreciate them so very much. And we're, we're praying for him, and we'll continue to pray for him. And we know that you will as he delivers uh, God's word. Mailey's saying we appreciate, love you all, appreciate you. Thank you, Brother Purdy. Give you a hug. When Satan would have you look at the trials of life that surround you, And he tries to appear and bring those doubts and fears all around you. Don't look him in the eye or listen with your ear. Just cry out to God. He is always near in your darkest hour. Your me.
And has your faith grown weak And you feel you're all alone Don't you give up For the God you serve won't leave you you just keep holding on why because there's a miracle in the making there's one just for you the father is working even now your prayers have been heard And the answer's on the way There's a miracle In the making for you today Thank you. Thank you to the Mealies for that lovely special in song and very relevant as well. Thank you to Brother Martin for his kind words of welcome. I honestly do not in any way, shape or form recognize the person he was introducing to speak this morning. I do not. I, if he said that person was speaking later, I would be looking forward to hearing them. But uh, I honestly feel entirely bereft of anything in myself and dependent entirely upon God and his grace uh, with us this morning. And I, as I was praying regarding this camp meeting, I wasn't actually planning to begin with this message. It is one that I have opened other meetings with, uh, and yet I do believe that it is the one that God wants us to look at this morning in some ways a continuation of a point that was brought out in last night's message and uh, even uh, the special song uh, this morning. And so if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 17. And what we see in this lovely little section of Scripture is what we might refer to as an illustration We'll read a verse from Hebrews chapter 11, and it gives us maybe more the principle. So we'll look at both the principle and then an illustration of that taken from this passage in Exodus 17. And do trust that it will be an encouragement to us this morning and even throughout the days of this camp meeting, as perhaps you are seeking God, that it would uh, be in his kind providence to use uh, this illustration for your encouragement, even as you seek after him. But we'll begin this morning by reading from Exodus chapter 17, and our reading will begin there in verse number 8. I invite you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's Word. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stead up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, for he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And we'll have a brief word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for your word again this morning. Thank you that it is inspired by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we have it in our hands this morning. And thank you for the promises again in your word that when your people are gathered, your spirit is amongst us. And that is our confidence this morning, that the spirit who inspired would now be pleased to teach and to open up and to show us wonderful things in this passage. And most of all, as always, we would see Jesus this morning, and we pray that you be glorified and honored. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Whenever I was uh, teaching in the high school at Penview, uh, we took the high school down to the farm show in Harrisburg and realized that many of you have likely been there before. It was a brand new experience for me, never been there before. I have never been there uh, since that, but uh, it was an amazing event. And obviously you have these uh, amazing machinery there, many, many animals, many, many things going on. And you could spend an awfully long time just going around and seeing everything that is to be seen. My enduring memory of the farm show is slightly surprising, though. The group of guys from the high school that I was responsible for, they uh, were talking about it on the way down. And then when we got there, they made a beeline to this tiny little spot in that sprawling complex. And the little spot that they were going to was where the army had their booth and or whatever. They had a little table there with some things on it. And then beside the table, there was a chin-up bar, which I think we all know what that is. It kind of explains itself. But the army guy explained how this worked. On the table, there were some baseball hats. There were some T-shirts. There were some hoodies. And the army guy said that if you could do, can't remember these details exactly, but if you could do like 10 chin-ups, then you would get a baseball cap. And if you could do 15, you would get a t-shirt. And if you could do 20, you would walk away with a hoodie. It was something like that. And so the army guy demonstrated how you do a legitimate chin-up that would qualify to count as one. You hold on, you pull your chin over the bar, let yourself down, and repeat as many times as you can. And honestly, the army guy made it look easy, very, very easy indeed. And I could see the young guys that were with me, they were grinning, they were excited, they were getting in line uh, to do it. And in their minds, they were all going home with a hoodie. Who could not do 20 chin-ups? If you haven't done chin-ups, you might fancy yourself leaving with a hoodie as well. And I can't remember the way exactly, but something like this. The first guy gets up and he is getting easily to the first five or six, and then he manages to pull off the seventh, but he cannot quite get the eighth chin-up actually eked out of his muscles. He was down and out. And the others were kind of giggling at this. This wasn't very flattering to him, but who couldn't at least go away with a baseball cow? And so the next guy get up and he maybe managed to eke out the eighth, but he couldn't get to the ninth. And the next one got up and out of all of the group that was with me, I think maybe two of them ended up going home with something. And the redness on their faces when they were done was not all from the exertion. Some of it was from the embarrassment that they hadn't even got a baseball cap. And when we would ask this very simple question, why can an army guy 
make it look so easy, but when we try to do it, it's so hard. Why is that? And the answer is fairly obvious. The army guy has been putting in perhaps years and years of diligence in that particular area. He has been working out, doing his chin-ups, doing his push-ups, doing all of those. And him making it look easy is, we might say, the reward for his diligence. And so when we get older, perhaps, or the older we get, the more aware we become that there are indeed rewards in life for diligence. And so when they said to me, Mr. Purdy, it's your turn, I said, no, thank you. I am aware of this principle, and I have not been diligent in that department at all, and I'm not even going to try. And so the older we get, the more aware we become that there are in this life rewards for the diligent. It simply is a fact that is woven into the very fabric of the way we live. Or we might imagine somebody perhaps brought up in the inner city somewhere and they maybe move out and they end up living in Pennsylvania and they go to your church and someone invites them for for dinner after church out to your home there and you set them a, a lovely dinner to eat and they say, I have never tasted vegetables like this. Where did you buy them? And you say, well, I didn't buy them, I grew them in my garden. And they've maybe moved out and they've got a little spot and they say, next year, I'm going to have vegetables on my plate just like this. And so the time comes and they're out in their garden and they're digging and they're planting. And then when they've all of that done, they still come to this realization that to actually sit down and enjoy vegetables that you have grown in your own garden, that's the reward for diligence. And if you're not diligent, then you don't get the reward. Or you might be in a doctor's office and sitting waiting and pick up some gardening magazine and looking through it and somebody might see this amazingly beautiful flower garden there that someone is sitting in, a, in, in the swing on their porch and they're observing the, the beauty of their garden. There's not a weed to be seen. Everything trimmed to perfection. The flowers are blooming. It is all spectacular. And someone might say, next year... My garden is going to look like that garden. And the next year rolls around and they start to try to make a garden that looks like that. And they are sweating and their muscles are hurting and they are aching. And that's just getting it started. And then when they do get it started, they realize that to sit on your swing and observe a garden and flowers that look like that, that is the reward for diligence. And if you are not diligent, you do not get the reward. And this is a truth that parents try to teach to their children, even in school. There are rewards for diligence. You might not see that now, but it is a fact, and we try to teach it and instill it in our children. There are rewards for diligence. And this truth, or even this law that is woven all through our lives and that we accept as obvious and very, very clear to be seen, that there are rewards for the diligent, also applies in our relationship with God for those who are God's people. Now, the scriptures are emphatic and clear that we are justified by faith and faith alone that we are saved apart from the deeds of the law, that we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Salvation is not a reward for those who have been diligent in their obedience. Salvation is a gift that is received by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to keep those waters entirely unmuddied and clear. If you are here and you are not saved, then the word of God is clear that salvation is by faith through grace. It is a gift of God and it is not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Those of us who have experienced his saving mercy are astonished at his grace, the unmerited kindness of God to us in offering us Christ to be our Savior. But for those who have put their faith in Christ and received the Holy Spirit, there are no embarrassment or there is none in the Bible about explaining there are rewards for the diligent in the Christian life. And I think we see an illustration of that in this chapter in Exodus 17. What we have here played out before our eyes in these verses is the very clear connection that exists between what God is doing on earth and what his people are doing on earth. That's what this passage here shows us, the clear connection between what God is doing on earth and what his people are doing on earth. So in this passage, we see that there is a battle between the Israelites and the Amalekites. And verse 8 tells us that then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So the Amalekites here are the aggressors. They are the ones who are attacking Israel in Rephidim. And this is not a parable. This is, this is, this is actual real life history that is being played out in the Old Testament. Rephidim is a real place. The Israelites were real people. The Amalekites were real. This is not a parable that is being made up to make a point. This is actual life that is being lived. And Israel, God's people, were under attack. Now, we're in Exodus 17 here. Back in Exodus 14, the children of Israel escaped from, or 13, they escaped from Egypt. Verse 14, the, chapter 14, they crossed the Red Sea. Chapter 15, they were rejoicing their hearts out for God's mercy to them. We're in chapter 17. So we're not very far after they left Egypt. We are not very far after they crossed the Red Sea. In other words, Israel at this point had precious little in terms of weapons. They had very little in terms of experience of battle or of war. They had very little knowledge or experience or weaponry in terms even whenever the Amalekites come to fight. They are very, very soon after they escaped from, Israel, from Egypt. And these Amalekites that are attacking them here were renowned for their cruelty. So we read in Deuteronomy that when Israel was leaving Egypt, the Amalekites attacked those at the back, the most vulnerable, the oldest and the weakest and the ones that were straggling behind and struggling to keep up. That was the way the Amalekites worked. There is kind of the embodiment of wickedness and evil and vileness, attacking the very weakest and most vulnerable. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, we read the Amalekites, whenever the men of Israel would be off fighting in battle, the Amalekites would attack the villages where the Israelites' wives and children were. There is something of a kind of embodiment of evil and of wicked and of sinfulness and of cruelty in the Amalekites here. And here, this is an unprovoked attack on the people of God. And Israel is now drawn into battle. Now, if we were there, we would hear the sounds of people screaming. We would have husbands who are there. Their wives are worried about what's happening. We have sons who are there. Their mothers are worried about what's happening in this battle. This is a real war that is being fought. And if a regular historian was recording this event, he would have recorded the normal facts. The location of the battle, the date of the battle, the number of casualties, the victor and the loser, the strategy and the tactics, and maybe try to explain it in some of those ways. But the author of Exodus does something else entirely. The author almost seems to us to have a camera in hand and one moment he is showing us the battle that is happening in the valley and the next moment he is showing us what is happening on the hilltop nearby. 
and the camera keeps panning back and forth what's happening on the mountain and what's happening in the valley. And when it zooms in to the mountain, we find Moses there holding the rod of God. Look at verse 9. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So when the camera is on the mountain, we have Moses with the rod of God held aloft in his hand. Not a usual picture for us today at all, but what does this mean? If we went back to chapter 15, we would see Moses with this rod, and when he got to the Red Sea, God said, lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea. So there is Moses with the rod lifted up, and as he lifts it up, the Red Sea parts. So the lifting up of the rod of God demonstrated visibly to everyone who was there that God was doing whatever was happening. The rod of God was lifted up and the Red Sea parted and everybody knew God's hand parted the Red Sea. Moses didn't part it. It was the power of God that divided the sea that they might walk across. Moses' hand could not part the Red Sea. All of Israel combined couldn't get across by their own brilliance or ingenuity, get across to the other side. The rod being lifted up was everyone noticing when that Red Sea parts, it is God and his power that did the parting, not us. But in some mysterious way, God did involve Moses. He said, Moses, you lift up the rod and I will do the parting of the sea. And so when we find Moses now on the top of this mountain and he is lifting up the rod of God, it is the same thing. It is Moses saying, God, we know that victory belongs to you and you alone. We know, God, that when you grant us the victory, it was you that gave us and not ourselves. And so the very act of lifting up the rod of God is Moses' way of saying, God, salvation belongs to you. Your hand is mighty to deliver your people. Your hand is mighty to divide the Red Sea. Your hand is omnipotent and ours is weak. And when he's lifting it up, he's saying, God, we're dependent on you for victory in the valley. We are dependent, we are reliant, we cannot gain this by our own might or by our own strength. And I think it's fair to say that the closest word that we have to describe what Moses is doing is Moses is praying. This is what prayer is. Prayer is this acknowledgement, this admission, this confession. God, I know that I cannot do this by my own might. Prayer is this confession, God, I can't do this, but I believe that you can. And so the prayerless person is in a sense saying, I've got this covered, God, I don't need you. And the prayerful person is the one who says, God, I don't have this in myself. I need you, I rely upon you, I'm dependent upon you, and I believe that my flimsy hand can do nothing, but your omnipotent hand can do anything. Now watch then what happens as the camera moves back and forth and see how clear this is. Look at verse 11. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand with the rod in it that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. It could not be more clear, could it? When the camera is on the mountain and Moses has his hands up in the air, the rod of God lifted, dependent upon God, reliant upon God, the children of Israel are advancing. And when his hands come down, the children of Israel are retreating. 
It could not be more clear. As Moses is lifting up his hand, God's arm is at work in the valley. And when Moses' hands are let down, the Amalekites are winning the battle. And so there are mysteries here, but when Moses' hands are down, the Amalekites have the upper hand, and if they had prevailed in the end, they would have stopped Israel's advances here right in its track. And surely God was teaching his people Israel that progress required prayer. That the means that God has ordained for the advance of his kingdom is prayer. That we can be very quick to dissect success and failure in in 101 different ways. But in this battle here, the Bible's analysis is simply this. Prayer was what brought the victory in the valley as Moses was depending on God. Moses' uplifted hands are this total dependence on God. Our arms are weak and flimsy and frail and fragile, but your arm is mighty to do anything at all, and therefore we give ourselves to prayer. We cannot rely on ourselves, but we can on our God. And so what we see here is, we might say, the power of prayer. How clear is the connection in this text? While Moses is praying, Israel is winning. And when Moses' hands are let down, Israel is losing. It's as plain as that. Not only do we have the power of prayer, what I love about this text is that it also shows us the pain or the hardness of prayer. Look at verse 12. Moses' hands were heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stead up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. In other words, it took effort for Moses to pray. It was exhausting for Moses to pray here on this mountain. It hurt for him to prevail on the mountain. So the passage seems to be saying progress for God's people requires prayer But the prayer that it requires often involves pain. Moses was so tired that he couldn't hold them up any longer is what we've read. And what I love is how brutally honest this passage is. We must not imagine, and the text will not allow us to say, Moses was having such a glorious time on the top of the mountain that he felt no pain. We can't say that because the text tells us he was weary and exhausted and his hands were heavy. We cannot say that the glory was so heavy or weighty or mighty on the mountain that Moses didn't even notice the time passing or feel any pain or any exhaustion. No, Moses was in pain even there as he was praying. And surely the clarity of this example was even for Moses humbling. If Moses cannot hold a rod in the air for a very long time, what chance do his people have in the valley fighting against the very powers of darkness? And so we see here that Moses in his praying is reminded of his weakness. He is reminded of his humanity. He is reminded of his fragility even that he cannot pray even long without this weariness and this exhaustion. And even while he is praying, he is reminded he is weak, but God is mighty. Back in chapter 15, when they were giving God such praise for his goodness, Moses said, The right hand, O Lord, thy right hand is become glorious in power. Verse 12, thy right hand, the earth swallowed them up. Verse 16, he speaks of the greatness of thine arm. Moses has seen what the power of God can do. And now he's reminded we desperately need that power because ours is weak and we are frail. 
And surely this is for our encouragement even this morning. It is easier, is it not, for us to sit around a table sipping our coffee and lament the darkness and the very embodiment of evil that we see around us and the decadence that has washed over society. It is so much easier to sip coffee and lament than it is to get alone with God and prevail in prayer. I have heard a variety of teaching that if you are really, really, really right with God, then prayer is always easy. Prayer is always exciting. Prayer is always uplifting. Prayer always feels encouraging. And this passage rebukes that kind of thought. If when you get alone with God to pray, it seems hard and the distractions seem fierce and you almost have to glue your knees down to the ground, as it were, then you're understanding the pain of prayer and it's not unusual. Every saint here would rise to their feet and testify that at times prayer is the most uplifting experience possible on earth as God is so kind and so gracious, but there are times whenever it looks very like Exodus chapter 15, 17. So we're reminded here of the pain of prayer. Moses' tiredness was obviously physical. Ours might not be so much. But like Moses, ours is the pain of saying no to something else so that we can say yes to meeting with God. It's the pain of saying no to something that seems easier so that we can say yes to something that is infinitely better than anything else. Sometimes for me, in all honesty, I would much prefer to read a good book on prayer than to actually pray. I love to read books of God answering prayer. I could read that book easily for hours at a time, and yet the hardness is when we come to pray. For some, it might be saying no to your technology for a little while that you can say yes to something infinitely better. Setting the phone outside the room, setting the whatever it is, or turning it off, saying, God, I realize that that is good and when I'm people I'm talking with, it is not bad, but there is something better and more important and as hard and as painful as it is, I say no to that so that I can say yes to you. Because God, their arms are as frail as mine, but yours is omnipotent and mighty to do things we cannot do. Sometimes it is saying no to the wretched busyness of life that robs us from time alone with God. Sometimes I don't know what it might be for you, but the pain is not necessarily going to be physical and the exhaustion is not necessarily going to be physical. The pain involved in prayer is saying no to something that is easier so that we can say yes to something that is better. And here in this passage, Moses said no to the ease of letting his hands down and he said yes to bringing in his friends even for his encouragement that they together might say, God, the battle belongs to you and salvation comes from you. We do find ourselves in a day when everything, the direction of everything is towards convenience and that's not a bad thing. We rejoice in all of the blessings we have. We can get in our car and drive through the drive through We don't even have to get out to get our food. Drive to the petrol station or the gas station and they might even fill it up for you. Don't even have to get out of your car. Drive to the pharmacy and they'll hand it out through a little hole in the wall. Everything towards convenience. But if we allow this to transfer into our walk with God, it doesn't work. There are rewards for diligence. How then is your diligence? And here Moses is so desperate that he says, God, I must and I will say no to what is easier and say yes to keeping this rod lifted up in the air so that your people might have victory and your name might be exalted. 
I heard of three ministers who were discussing the merits of what posture they had in prayer. While they were discussing this, a telephone repairman was working in the same room, working away as they were talking, and one of the ministers or pastors insisted that folding his hands as he prayed somehow helped him, and another maintained that he had to be on his knees to really feel like he was praying. And the third one said, I, I really, when I really pray, I am flat on my face before God. And the telephone repairman couldn't resist, and he said, I have found that the most powerful prayer I ever prayed was hanging upside down by my feet from a power pole 40 feet above the ground. Suddenly, everything else seems to not matter. And here he was, crying his heart out. How then is our desperation for victory today? How deep our yearnings for the glory of God? How deep our passion for the name of God to be hallowed in our midst. For Moses was desperate, and therefore he said no to what was easy, and yes to the pain of prayer. My final point then this morning, if there is great power in prayer, but prayer is often painful, what is it that keeps a man praying even when it's painful? What is it that keeps a man or a woman or a boy or a girl or a young person praying whenever it is painful? What keeps us saying yes to prayer even whenever other things are calling that are easy? And I think our answer is here in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Listen to this. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is a rewarder of diligent seekers. We know again we are justified by faith alone apart from the deeds of the law or our own earnings or our own effort. We are saved by faith. But here God is saying that his people who pray must believe that he is, that he exists. But not only that, that in his very nature, God is a rewarder of diligent seeking. God in his character rewards diligence in those that seek him. God in his very nature is unchangeably of such a nature that when people diligently seek him, he rewards them in their seeking. This is not a mood with God that we have to wonder, is God in that kind of a mood today that if I diligently seek him, he will reward? No, this is not a mood with God. This is the nature of God. This is, to put it like this, in the DNA of God, in his unchangeable nature. And therefore, this passage convinces us that diligent seekers will always prove they will always prove that God is a rewarder of such people. Are you yearning for the glory of God? Are you yearning for, for, for God to keep some promise in your life? then this passage reminds us that whenever we diligently seek, we are coming to a God who in his nature is generous and rewards diligent seekers. That's why, Jeremiah, we can have such a promise as this. You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Why is it? Because God says, in my very nature, in my unchanging character, I am a rewarder of diligent seeking. And doesn't God try to get this message over to us from the beginning of the Bible to the end? God is a giving God. God gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is a giving God. He is a generous God. 
If the devil is subtly tempting you that God is reluctant to give, that you are having hard thoughts about God's generosity, what does the gospel say? The gospel said that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We would not have dared, God, send your eternal son down in the, and take on flesh and blood and hang on a cross and die for us. We wouldn't have dared, but before we even asked, this is the God that we seek. The God revealed in Scripture as generous beyond our wildest even thoughts can imagine. Romans chapter 8 and verse 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How can we look at the Lord Jesus? How can we look at the cross and have hard thoughts about the generosity of God? Does that not stir us? Here is a God who is generous, and I want to seek him because in his nature, he rewards diligent seeking. The Lord Jesus in Luke 11 and verse 5, God incarnate tells a parable about a man who went to his friend's house at midnight looking for bread. The friend was inside. His children had got to sleep, and some of you know how this is. When the little children have got to sleep, How dare anybody start banging on the door to waken them up? Like you are trying to say it in that perfect volume that the one outside can hear, but it won't wake these ones up. Go away. Go away. If they waken up, this is going to take forever to get them down. And so the friend inside doesn't want to go to the door, but the man knocking on the door is diligent. I'm not leaving your door until I get bread. And the Lord Jesus tells us that the man will finally get out of his bed and his motivation is to get the man at the door away from the door and to solve this problem. And the point is, if a man would get out of his bed out of a really kind of bad motive, really, how much more would a loving father Respond to the diligent seeking of his children. God incarnate told us about a widow who came to a godless judge whose heart was like a stone and the man wouldn't listen. He wouldn't hear her cries, but she kept coming. She was diligent and finally to get rid of this woman really, to get her off his back. It says that the unjust responded and gave her what she was asking for. And the point is, how much more would a loving father who sent his son for our salvation hear the diligent cries of his people? Is not all of Scripture conspiring, if you like, to convince the people of God? God rewards diligent seeking. He is generous. He is kind. He gave us His Son. His Son gave His life for us. And therefore, when we come, we believe. God, you will not deny the diligent cries of your people. I read of a, somewhere of a man who had a well on his farm It served him very well for years. He brought his horses and cattle to drink, drew for a long time sufficient for the needs of all his herds. But a drought came one summer and the flow of water stopped from this well. He had to drive his animals to surrounding springs and brooks to give them the water they needed. One day a visitor uh, inquired about why he was doing this and the man explained And the visitor said, the next, uh, why didn't he dig the well a little deeper? The visitor said, the next digging uh, may bring you to that gushing stream of water. And the farmer said, the problem is that the next digging must be done through a layer of rock. And the visitor persisted and said, even so, though it may be hard for you to get through when you blast through the rock, just a little way down may be such a refreshing stream of water that you will be solved all of these difficulties of going here, there, and everywhere. This was done, and to the farmer's amazement and joy, that next blast brought in a gushing stream of water which not only filled the well, but overflowed the well. 
Is it possible that someone even this morning is discouraged in your waiting on God? What if just a little more diligence in your waiting and that very well of gushing water would overflow the very boundaries of your heart? What if there is a miracle in the making One just for you. Therefore, keep on diligently seeking. God's people are to have this unwavering conviction that in the nature of God, he is a rewarder of diligent seeking. One final concluding illustration here is of a man called Michael He was an only child, and his dad would sometimes say, when I pass away, you won't have any issues with the will. You're the only child. And uh, indeed, when his father did pass away, there was no other siblings that Michael had to have any problems with. But he did have problems because he could not find his father's will. He said the will was nowhere to be found. I looked everywhere. I found his fireproof safe. It wasn't there. I looked through all his files. It wasn't there either. I searched high and low. He said, I was paying tens of thousands of dollars in taxes because I could not produce a valid will. I was unable to prove that I was the sole heir and it was costing me major money in lawyer's fees and other red tape. And so you can only imagine how diligent that man Michael was in looking for his father's will. In real terms, we would say nothing else seemed to matter to Michael. Nothing else at all. This was his obsession. This was his one concern. He searched everywhere, searched places twice and three times He said, I finally found my dad's will, not in a place I would have ever thought to look, hidden behind his college diploma. And we can imagine his relief and his joy whenever he found it. But this thought struck Michael something like this. When was the last time I sought God as diligently as I've sought my Father's will. How long, how long since you sought for God so earnestly, so diligently as that man was looking for his dad's Because what he was actually looking for and searching for was something of monetary value. But when we seek diligently the face of God, it is of infinite and incalculable value what God gives to his people. As you leave then this morning, bear this in mind throughout the week. God is a rewarder of diligent seeking. And if you want an illustration, think of Moses as he was raising up the rod there on the mountain. And as the rod was up, the Israelites were advancing. And as he let it down, the Amalekites were advancing. But at the end of the day, God gave the victory. And when we get to the end of that chapter, Moses builds a little altar and he's saying, God, to you be the glory and the honor and the majesty. Our arms were so weak, but yours was so mighty. But in the mystery and grace of God, Moses' prayers were involved in the very working of God in that valley. May God bless you this morning.